Welcome everybody to worship here at New Hanover Evangelical Lutheran Church. We thank you for joining us today and whether you're joining us live or viewing us at a later time, we are still one body in Christ and one community in God's presence, so we welcome you. Also, a big hello to everybody out there that's live here in our audience and our campus here with our worship service. And at this time, if you want to get out a candle and light it to invite in the presence of Christ and also get your Bibles ready for our Bibles reading, be prepared now as we show you a few slides on our mission that we're doing here on our campus and in the world today.
theme of ready, set, go. Ready was preparing yourself mentally to be, bring God into your life. Set was taking action and starting to plan how you were going to bring God into your life. And going was actually doing it. These are moments throughout the week, small moments, that we found these themes and we felt the presence of God within our camp. On Tuesday, we went on a field trip to the Padre Pio Museum. So I did not know who Padre Pio was. So if you are wondering who he is, he was a priest and he used healing through Christ. So while we were there, we learned about the stories of two different people. There was one, a little girl who had a very severe medical condition and her parents were told that she did not have much time left. And her mother had started smelling the strong smell of roses and she had gotten a call by Padre Pio saying to come see him. So they packed up and went all the way over to Italy to see him. And they were in the first meeting with him the first day they were there and he just walked by and put his hand on her head. They went back the second day because the mother was like, well, we didn't even get to talk to him. So they went back the second day and he placed his hand on her head again. So after that, they had returned home, and a few weeks later, they had went back to the doctors, and they had taken another x-ray, and her bladder had come back. There was another spot, and her bladder was back. So she was able to live, and she is actually alive right now still. The second person was a man who was in a very bad vehicle accident and had had severe head trauma and issues with his brain. And also the doctors were not thinking it was going to be a good outcome. So their mo his mother was praying and she had heard of Padre Pio. So she was praying to him that he would help. And the one night in the hospital room, the man saw a man in a robe standing in his doorway, which he had thought was his uncle. And the roommate also saw this man, which he assumed was the man's uncle. And he was telling his mom about seeing this man. And his mother was like, that's not your uncle. And they were like, well, and who could have it been? So it must have been Padre Pio. So on Tuesday night, our counselors were all sitting there talking before they went to bed. And they started to smell this strong smell of roses or any type of flower, like a floral scent. And they were thinking, man, that's, that's really weird. We were just talking about that today, how when Padre Pio was present, that's the smell that they were smelling. And as they walked back to their tents, they had smelled it as well. And they had figured that someone was with us. As you know, every year we hand out these bags and then we collect them with food in them to give to the multi-service. We um, were passing them out on Tuesday, and while we did that, there was this man in a wheelchair at one of the houses we stopped at. And when we handed the man the information, he was reading through it, and he said he couldn't go out and get any food, but he still wanted to give. So he went back into his house, and he came out, and he said he was going to give us $2. He started sorting through a bunch of change, so you could tell that this was really, like, a lot to give from him. And that was really a show of how he was putting God in his life and giving even though he wasn't, didn't have the most and wasn't necessarily receiving the most. On the first night, we did a labyrinth to get our mind ready to accept Christ. Before we started, there was no wind. And then while we, when we started, the wind started to pick up. And then it stopped when we finished. And it shows that the Holy Spirit was with us during that time. These are a few of the stories, a few of the things we did during camp this week.
Good evening. I, I don't know, would you say happy Monday Thursday? What is it? Uh, miserable Monday Thursday? I don't know. We almost had miserable with the weather here just a little bit, but it seemed to blow by and we didn't get hit very hard, so that's good. Oh, I just want to let you know there's no, um, when we start this service, um, this is the beginning of the Easter service uh, in our tradition in the Lutheran theology and faith and some other Christian faiths. Uh, they basically start at, at Monday, Thursday, so there will be no benediction, there will be no sending, there will be no go get them. It'll be a silent go get them at the end. <laughs> but um, after the altar is stripped and we sing our psalm, um, please just leave in, in silence there if you have never been part of this great service. And tonight will be communion, so everybody at home and everybody that's here today, um, this is a love story. Uh, this um, reading tonight is a great love story, and it's one in which Jesus Christ invites all, even Judas. He hands Judas the bread, and we'll find out in the story, even knowing that Judas is about to betray him, and Jesus feeds him and gives him the bread of life anyway. So what a great love story it is. And so um, I invite you at home and everybody here, um, we don't judge anybody. So everybody is welcome to the table, uh, the table of Jesus Christ. Also, just one last announcement, because there is no announcement area. You still can come out. If you haven't signed up for our Synod-wide um, Synod Day for Mission Day here. We will be working in the cemetery. We'll be working in the garden. We'll be working in the picnic grove. We'll be working inside doing crafts for the homebound. And um, the other 48 Lutheran churches in our synod are invited also to come here and sign up and be with us. At 9 o'clock, the bishop gives us this big send-off, and, uh, and then so we'll gather, we'll do the hurrah, and go out and uh, do whatever we do um, as part of our mission. But um, please, just come and join. If you, if you don't think you have the time, and at the last minute you're like, oh, I got some time now, come on out. Come on out next Saturday on the 23rd, 9 o'clock, and uh, there'll be room for you, whichever you want to do. So at that Allow us to begin our love story with our prelude at the midnight hour.
please rise as you are able. I was not taking pictures of myself. My wife was motioning my hair was sticking straight up in the air. So if you have a smartphone, they're a great thing. If you have a camera, you can take a picture and then prim and then get back. Is it still sticking straight up? Okay, good. <laughs> well, allow us to begin our worship service. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Let down your guard. Make yourself at home. Release the tension in your jaw. Take a deep breath. Return to God with all your heart. Lent can sometimes get a negative reputation. It's viewed as a season in our faith when we give up things and we prepare for the worst. However, I cannot imagine that God wants more from us than just six weeks of discipline or six weeks without chocolate. I cannot help but imagine that God wants a life for us so expansive that faith and joy and hope flow over the edges. So let us confess, not because we have to suffer our way through Lent, but because the truth moves us one more step closer to that expansive faith that God promises us. Let us pray. Holy God, we confess we don't return to you fully. We share with you the pieces of our lives that are convenient. We put on different hats in different rooms. We forget that we are called, invited, and loved with all that we are, including our mess, our beauty, our faith, and our doubt. Forgive us and give us hearts that long to return. Friend, God sees you. God hears you. God loves you. You are forgiven and claimed with all that you are. Rest in that good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join together and sing, Lift High the Cross. You'll find...
reading from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take it to some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its heads and legs and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be the day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please rise as you are able. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own and who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas' son, a Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table and he took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Lord answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, Jesus had put on his robe and had returned to the table, and he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another one's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. And very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, 
and God has been glorified in him. If God had been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you shall also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. A whole bunch of symbolism in this story, right? Talked about the Passover, and we have that reading from the Passover, and and Faye, we probably should uh, start scheduling readers. I, I'm not used to reading too long passages anymore. I don't know. I just we'll need some help here, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we we have here the the whole Passover, and he gives a description of what goes on, and we know the stories of Egypt and Moses and and leaving and um, and leaving slavery and being free. And then also we find Jesus ready to prepare for Passover. And we see symbolism in here about girding. They talk about that. Uh, the Lord talking to Moses and tells him how we should gird ourselves. And you basically didn't use the word gird here, but Jesus does the same. Except it's very, you know, it's very us- unusual for the master of the house, the master of the feast, the one that preparing the Passover, presiding over the Passover, for him to be the servant. This was something usually done by their slaves, people that were non-Jews. Non-Jews did not wash other people's feet before, I mean, Jews did not wash other Jews' feet before meals. This was strictly forbidden. This is, this is not, this is not in their culture. It's not in the Torah. It's totally out there. It would make them unclean. But Jesus Christ then tells them that this is the way of the future, and then we need to change, and we need to love each other. But he shows them such a greater part of love. Now, we always hear about love stories. And I'll get into a little bit about Jesus' love story here. Now, does anybody have a favorite love story? Everybody's smiling, but no one... Will you please share it with me if you have a favorite love story, if you're not embarrassed? Marsha, are you coming forward to tell me your love story? Nancy. No, they're both running. (laughs) Make note to the people in video land that they both have run. I can't even. (laughs) Well, there is the famous love story of the movie, right? What other love stories are out there? Romeo and Juliet, famous Shakespeare, right? Yeah. Yeah, what else? Gone with the Wind. Ooh, a classic, right? Should I do my... uh, uh, Charlotte impersonation? No, no. I don't think I can say those words in church, can I? <laughs> what else? Now, this is G-rated. There's children at home, and we have a child here, so be careful. I mean, Cinderella. Cinderella. Wow, what a great one. Ooh. You know, there are so many out there. We all have our favorite. We're all smiling. And I bet you could probably tell a love story of your own in your own life and about something that you loved or someone who you had loved and how you act when you're in love. But I think my dad had you all beat. He did. George. Now, George was famous for his talking of love. Um, on his helmet, my dad's helmet at Bethlehem Steel, he wore a helmet. He was a crane man and then a crane operator down on the floor. Um, he would defy it because he became somewhere in the rank of the union um, that he didn't feel that he didn't define um, to follow the rules. So he put hearts on his yellow helmet, and he said, 255 pounds of instant love. That was my dad. You know, he, he was a little bit of a card. He was a little bit of a card. But his famous part, and which I always um, loved, was the way that when we had one television after he moved in with Marsha and I and the family, we had one television in the beginning as we were out in Bartow in this tiny little cabin and uh, this house. And it was the kind where 
we didn't have cable up there yet in Bartow up on the mountain, so we, we had to turn the, the antenna, right? And so he would have my children, George would have my children, turning the antenna until he got to the spot. Marsha, coming home from work, was not, you know, uh, didn't know my dad that well yet, but she soon got to know him. And she said, George, what's going on? He said, Marsha, I said, uh, uh, make some popcorn. So Marsha would go out and make popcorn. She goes, what is it? He goes, there's a love story about to come on. And she would get all excited and bring the bowl of popcorn out. And here the Phillies would come on. They'd sit down there with the popcorn and <laughs> the Phillies. He called the Phillies the love story. And, and so it went with every season. So the, the Phillies, the Eagles, they were all love stories. And so soon to learn, Marsha found out my dad's idea of what a love story was. But tonight's gospel love story is the greatest love story ever told. And I don't know if you caught it. I don't know if you caught it. We, we pointed out all those other things, and we do know to tell the story that Jesus Christ, and here we are at Easter, right? We're going to have Easter in a couple days, and we're all celebrating, you know, and, and um, we have Good Friday tomorrow. We tell about the passion and about the death of Jesus Christ, and then on Sunday we are going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But tonight's a different story, but no less important than the other two. For tonight, we talk about the beginning of the greatest love story, and it happens during this time when Jesus is here, and also will happen in the garden a little bit later. For you see in there, in the very beginning it tells us, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world. So before this whole story unfolds, with the story of Passover, Good Friday, Easter, celebrations we created as Christians, but in this passion story, we have the most beginning part because we find out our character knew that he would die. But also... It says in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God. Say that again. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. So Jesus knew that he would die, but yet God had put it in his hands. You see, Jesus was fully human and fully divine. God giving us, as humans, free choice, right? We have free choice. We have free will, right? That's the gift from God to us. We're not robots. We're not puppets. Nor was Jesus in sense. Son of God, but fully human. So Jesus, knowing that he had this choice to make, does the unthinkable. I mean, because if we are to go out, like Jesus said, serve and love one another and tell my story, go out and proclaim the good news, how do you talk about this superhero that we have in Jesus Christ and God? I mean, who could make up a better love story? God so willingly just said, you guys aren't getting it. I gave you the Ten Commandments. I gave you all this and all that and that and I gave you the covenant of Abraham and I gave you this and the Moses and, and, and uh, Jacob. And, and it, it goes on and on and on. And we're still fallible. And we're still not following and worshiping and loving and caring for God. So God goes, eh, I'll just come down to earth. So we have the incarnation. It starts on Christmas, what we celebrate as Christmas. But the incarnation of God as a human being. So God now has free will. Now, who's superhero in today's story? I asked you about love stories. What about superhero stories? They're all over the movies, and they're all over our video and our devices and comic books. People who still read comic books, <laughs> they're still out there, right? We wish we had them. Our older, um, our older generation would still wish we had the comic books when we were that we had when we were younger, right? But the, the um, thing is, is that this thing that makes it a comic book uh, superhero is what superhero would come without any, any protection as a child and fully have to rely on others to take care of them? And yet God does that. And then what superhero has this choice of whether to die or to live and yet chooses the death? 
I mean, how do we tell that story? How do we convince somebody that there is a God, that there's Jesus Christ, and there's the greatest, the greatest being on earth, and the greatest God, and the greatest love story ever told? And I think it comes into that whole story and that whole genre, the way the story is written, about everything that God did, because God loves us so much. And in the end, God had a choice through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and yet Jesus Christ chose to go to the cross. And we said, lift high the cross. What story would people believe that if, you know, you go and try to tell them a story and you're wearing your cross, you know, and, and you're wearing this cross, and they're just like, well, tell me that story. Why do you wear a cross? Well, it's a symbol of death, right? It's a symbol of death and infallibility. And they're, and they're like, so your God died on a cross, allowed them to, to torture him and yeah, yeah, that's the story. <laughs> because there was no other way to defeat death. There was no way to defeat evil. And so God shows the greatest love story ever told by choosing to die for us. And I believe there is no greater story that ever can be told. So thinking back, you may talk about what it was, how it had happened, we go through this denial, right, even sometimes ourselves. Is it real? Did it happen in that? But I got to believe, I truly believe, that God, the creator of the world, the most intelligent of having the knowing and the will, chose to die to show God's love for us. And there's no greater show of love than one sacrificing, and as Jesus said, to be a servant fully for another. Amen. Let us rise as we are able, and let us sing together where charity and love prevail. you find it number 359 in your hymnals. Welcome the children and saw this world as it could be. We believe that expansive love runs over the edges of our lives, smoothing our rough places and pulling us home. 
We call that expansive love Yahweh, Mother God, Jesus, and Divine Creator. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. Jesus has always been the one to invite. He said, He said, He said, Jesus has always been the one to invite, and that has not changed. So friends, you are invited to this table, each and every one of us, with our doubts, our fears, our scars, our joy, our dreams, our hopes, our questions. We are invited to God's table. And here, we will be met. Here, we will be fed. Here, we are given a taste of an expansive life that is full to the brim with love overflowing with joy. So come, come now, my brothers and sisters, not because you must, but because you can. Come, you are invited. This table is for you. God who knows us, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. Your hope never runs dry. Your joy never gives up. We wish that we could be more like you in that way. In a world that loves scarcity, your abundance is shocking. In a world that knows fear, your joy is compelling. In a world that knows anxiety, your peace is captivating. We love for these things. So today we ask you to be with us on a hamster wheel. Be with us when compassion fatigue rears her head. Be with us when stress makes it hard to breathe. Be with us when self-doubt pushes in close. Be with us when exhaustion becomes constant or when loneliness becomes our primary language. Be with us and show us the way to life you long for us. Show us a life of expansive faith. Show us a life of overflowing joy. Show us a life of absorbing beauty. Show us a life of engrossing purpose. Show us a life that is as honest and rich and meaningful as the one Jesus led. And until that expansive and holy day, we will continue to gather at this table. Until that day, we will continue to look for you in our midst. So pour out a double portion of yourself onto this bread and this cup so that we might catch a glimpse of your goodness. God, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. So bring that never-ending love here. To get it together, we pray. Our Father, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and gave it all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you, take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May the sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.